Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Gaming Tentacom video, we're going to be discussing used games, the Xbox One, as well as AAA titles and a few other bits and pieces. It's going to be kind of a first in a series. It's going to be fairly lengthy. Now, I know we've been speaking about the stuff extensively recently, and I know it risks becoming somewhat boring. However, in this video, there have been numerous comments from both Microsoft, well, apparently a disgruntled Microsoft employee, as well as multiple um, large game developers, and they've all been weighing in their opinion, as you'd expect. But it's becoming extremely interesting, this topic, to me, because although it can become a bit tedious in one respect, because everyone's giving their opinion, at the same time, it is one of those issues that is probably the most important in gaming right now. And I, I'm i not actually kidding. The problem is, there is a distinct um, point of view right now that AAA games are becoming less and less profitable. And this is once again going into the realms of development risk as well. So we're going to be talking a little bit about this, and I'm also going to be doing a follow-up video to this, because this video is going to become fairly lengthy, and I think it's a good idea for me to produce, say, half of it, and then we're going to take a break, or I'm going to take a break, and then I'm going to do some more research on this, and then I'll do another video, because... As I said, it's going to become fairly lengthy, so I don't want to try and cram it all into one thing, because it's going to be very difficult to do so, because, as I've said previously, this is an absolutely ridiculously huge topic. So, we're going to kick things off with a reported self... Um, well, disgruntled Microsoft employee. Now, he apparently was working on the Xbox One, and he was actually instrumental in its design. So I'm going to read you guys out a quote. And he said... And I quote, Being part of the team that created the entire infrastructure to include the POS, that would be point of sale, not what you're thinking, mechanisms, I must say that I'm extremely sad to see it removed. But the, custom, but the consumer knows what is best. I can place the blame on no one but us here at Microsoft. We didn't do a good enough job explaining all the benefits that came with the new model. We spent too much of our time fighting against the negative impressions that many people in the media formed. Now, I'm going to end the quote for a moment. This is pretty much what I was saying in several videos. Um, Microsoft just couldn't go on the offensive. It, they were basically in the corner just getting used as a human punching bag because it was getting to the point where everyone was making fun of them. Whether you were a gamer, whether you were a Sony fan, whether you were a Nintendo fan, whether you were a PC gamer, even Microsoft um, gamers were, and talking about Xbox 360 gamers, were making fun of them because it was getting to the point where it was just the thing to do on the internet. It was becoming the new meme. It was becoming ridiculous. And... The problem was they just weren't being offensive enough. Now, as I said, that's not to say that the new model didn't deserve some criticism. There were some problems with it, definitely. But the problem with any change is that you have to make your case, right? People may not like your case. You can make the best case you can, but they still might not like it. Microsoft, however, weren't making the case. It felt like they went into a lot of the stuff and they simply didn't know really how to sell it to the public. They just assumed that it's almost like me saying to you, okay, well, you know what, I'm sorry your wall's broken. You're going to have to buy a few new bricks for it. They thought that you were just going to say, okay, fine, this is how it is. And of course, this was even hurt more by Sony. Now, we're going to talk about Sony a lot more in a moment because there's a lot of information on them as well. And indeed, a couple of senior game designers actually believe that Sony were instrumental in, well, Microsoft changing their policies. Not us. In other words, not the press, not the gamers who are going to buy the system, but Sony. So we're going to talk extensively about the stuff. But as I said... I personally believe that Microsoft just didn't know how to sell this right. They just weren't prepared for the onslaught that they received, and therefore they just couldn't move forward with this. I've been very vocal on this. And as it turns out, I think some of the features we have lost are quite sad to lose. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more, but let's talk a little bit more about this uh, disgruntled Microsoft employee. He hasn't named himself. As I said, it is Anonymous Source. And this is from Pastebins, by the way. 
He goes on to say that while publishers have never came round out to us at Microsoft and said, we want you to do something about used gaming, we could hear it in their voices and read it in their numerous public statements. The used game industry is slowly killing them, and every attempt to slow down the bleeding was met with much resistance from the gaming community. I will admit that online passes were not well received, nor were they well implemented. But I felt that time to mature it could have turned into something worth having as a gamer, much like DLC. We went from pointless horse armor to amazing season passes like Borderlands 2. Video game development is a loss leader by definition. And unlike other forms of media, video games only have one revenue stream and that is selling to you, the gamer. So when you buy a used game, it's hurting the developers much more than say a movie studio. Many gamers fail to realize this when they purchase those pre-aimed games. It's impossible to continue to deliver a movie-like experience with the current costs without giving up something in return. It's what gamers want and expect. The best-selling games are blockbusters. The highest rated are blockbusters. The most loved are blockbusters. How can developers continue to create these experiences if consumers refuse to support them? Many will argue the development system is broken, and I disagree. The development system is near broken. It's used gaming that is broken. But regard this, I think there's more emphasis on this from both us and Microsoft. For both us at Microsoft and publishers would have gone a long way in helping educate the gamer. But again, it is us who dropped the ball in this regard. For that, we are sorry. So, uh, end quote, by the way. I can't remember if I said that, because uh, I just took a small moment break. Um, so, is this rubbish? Is it becoming to the point where blockbuster AA games or AAA games, shall I say, are becoming more expensive? Well, yes. It's not getting to the point where they are not making money. But it is getting to the point where if the game is not a big seller and it was expensive to make, they're boned. Um, and even Bethesda themselves, who um, uh, what is actually in an interview, and this is a separate article, but Bethesda um, was speaking recently and Pete Hines from Bethesda was talking actually about AAA games in his opinion. And it's not really anything particularly new. He's actually echoing a lot about the stuff. He said, and I quote, I don't think there's ever been a scenario in which I would not be worried about everything. Even if all AAA games were doing well, I would be worried when they won't be. Um, it's my job to worry. If you just assume everything's going to be great, there's a very dangerous mindset. I feel that if we continue to do, continue to do pretty well with the success of Skyrim and success of Dishonored, we will stick with what we know and we have done pretty well with it and it's going to proceed going forward. A while ago, it was social games that were all the rage and people were asking, why weren't we doing Facebook? That's not something we do and that's not no longer a big deal. So we didn't run after it and we're not going to run away from it. We're just doing kind of stuck uh, doing the thing that we feel is best. And that's not to say we're not branching out. We started a new studio out of Austin uh, led by Rich Vogel called Battle Cry, which is working on a free to play title. So we're not clear so we're clearly not like, oh, it needs to be a premium priced triple A game and stuff on disc. We have other stuff in the works. So it's getting to the point, as I've said, where the video game market is becoming a lot more volatile. It is certainly not collapsing, but it is getting to the point where Studios are somewhat nervous now. They're apprehensive of how much a new game is going to cost. That's why that we're seeing so many multi-format releases. That's why even Metal Gear Solid is being released on Xbox as well as the PlayStation. Because if you're developing, if you're sinking millions into a game, and I do mean millions, then you need to make sure it sells as well as possible because otherwise if you're just breaking even then you might as well not bothered you might as well just have kept your money and just had your team just sit there twiddling their thumbs it's that simple now speaking of the xbox one for a moment longer he was also talking about family sharing demos now you may remember about the social circle and family pl uh, share plans now the idea behind this is you could give gamers um so when I was ever Xbox One owners, shared library, and that they could put their games in. So let's say you and I are friends on Xbox Live. I can identify you as a family member. So you're self-identifying. It's not like you know Microsoft running background checks on you or whatever. 
And so in other words, I have a feeling that there would have been a lot of brothers and a lot of sisters who probably never met themselves before and um, never met their relative before, if you know what I mean. But when you did this, they would have access to the game, regardless of where they were in the world. Now, obviously, that does raise a few questions, such as regional restrictions. For example, what happens if a game is released in, say, oh, I don't know, America, but it's not licensed yet in Japan, what the balls happens in that respect, but I guess they just didn't get that far. Anyway, there is a small caveat here. It's not massive, well it is actually, but he quotes, when your family member accesses any of your games, they're placed in a special demo mode. This demo mode, in most cases, would be a full game with 15, 45 minute timer, and in some cases an hour. Uh, this allows the person to play up uh, play the game, get familiar with it, and make the passage if they wanted to. When the game time limit was up, they would be automatically prompted to the marketplace where they could uh, either order it if they liked the game. So is that true? If this guy is speaking a load of rubbish, well, apparently um, it has been confirmed. The Verge themselves comments and confirms that their sources at Microsoft say the family sharing feature was limited to an hour, but it wasn't disclosed. In other words, this wasn't common knowledge to us. Apparently as well, there was what is known as a home space on the user's Xbox Live uh, account. Um, and the idea behind this was to act as a, no a natural social network. So you would have stuff like uh, voice to text capabilities, um, and various other bits and pieces. So the idea behind that was that it would be a hell of a lot easier and you wouldn't have to worry about, say, typing on a keyboard or whatever while you're getting shot in the back if you're trying to answer someone. He also continues, and should I say concludes, with, we at Microsoft have amazing plans for the Xbox One that will most that will make it an amazing experience for both gamers and entertainment consumers alike. I stand by the belief the PlayStation 4 is Xbox 360 Part 2, while the Xbox One is trying to revolutionise entertainment consumption. For people who don't want the amazing additions, like Don said, we have a console for that, and it's called the Xbox 360. So is that document real? Well, it's very difficult to know. It is anonymous. However, there is definitely some inside information there. Um, just how much inside information, it's unknown. Whether they're a real employee or not, it's hard to tell. However, it does seem extremely close to what Microsoft have been echoing before. Regardless, we do have definite information from someone by the name of Cliff Blensky. Now, I'm sure you guys are aware of him. He, of course, has been extremely vocal on both DRM and used games. And, of course, he used to work with Epic. Now, he has been very, very blunt in saying that he believes that used games are killing the industry. Um, and he actually said that on Twitter, Sony forced Microsoft's hand, not the internet whining. You're going to see digital versions of your favorite games with added features and content to lure you to the digital over disk based. He also added on Tumblr, Microsoft tried to and ultimately couldn't have it both ways. You can't still have disks and expect everyone to embrace digital. And fundamentally, you take something away that the consumer has been used to without some seriously smooth handling, they're naturally going to be upset. He also mentions that despite the fact that he himself used to buy used games before he became become um, part of Epic and everything else, and of course was very successful there. And he also points out very happily that PC games um, that are used are very hard to find now. Obviously, you do have DRM-free titles, for example, GOG and so forth, but primarily most titles are either through Steam, Origin, um, and so forth. So is he completely and utterly on Microsoft's side? No. He himself agreed that the 24-hour check-in was silly. I'll read the quote. I'll admit that once every 24-hour check-in was pretty silly. Cus consumers can smell from a mile away that you're treating them like children. Peeking your head into their bedroom on a regular basis and to attempt to catch them doing something. Here's the thing about Steam. It doesn't force you to be online. I he does emphasize force you to be online. The ecosystem of Steam is so brilliant from the community to the summer sales to the indie games that you want to get online. 
And this is pretty much what I've been saying. Um, in my personal opinion, and bear in mind, I am not Cliff, I am not an Xbox One designer, but I have been gaming a while, and I've been using Steam for a while. And I am a PC gamer primarily, but I'm also a console gamer, and I've owned, well, a lot of consoles, including the original Xbox, the Xbox 360, the PlayStation, the PlayStation 1, and well before. And I'll agree with this guy. The problem is, you cannot just tell someone, well, you know what, you're going to have to go online every 24 hours just to make sure you're not being naughty. It doesn't work. People are going to get pissed. As I've said in another video as well, the other problem is Microsoft were just bloody unlucky. The fact that they came about at the exact time that all these privacy issues are happening, um, wow, they, they couldn't have timed it worse if they actually tried. I don't think they could have. It's pretty much impossible on their end. The problem is, Microsoft continued to say that this is like Steam. PC gamers love Steam. They were talking about Origin. PC gamers love Origin. Maybe. But everyone loves Steam. I don't think anyone, despite the fact that, yes, technically, if Valve wanted to, they could shut down your account. And you would lose access to all your games, basically. Um... The problem is, no one worries that Valve are going to do that, unless you're like a complete and utter bastard. They're not going to do this. I mean, sure, there's probably one or two people who have had issues with Steam. I'm not going to say that Valve are some flawless, um, you know, deity and saint, because obviously they are a bunch of humans, and therefore they're going to have issues with either their system, or accidentally flagging one person maybe for gross cheating or whatever but generally people trust Valve why do they trust Valve because they feel that, well Valve have their back the problem when you're telling consumers that yes we want you to be online yes we will you know give you all of these services the problem is people didn't ask for those services People didn't ask for the 24-hour check-in. If they had, however, had said, look, we're taking away used games, we're working with publishers and developers to make games go on sale every so often as a, as a, you know, as a penalty, as a, as a way to make it up to you guys who don't buy used. We're making, we're trying our best to ensure that you know, we'll work with you um, to make games as cheap as possible on the Xbox One. We'll not put a 24-hour um, thing on, but, so every 24-hour check, but if you go online, you're going to be that much happier, because we're going to make sure that your experience on the Xbox is fantastic. We're going to give away titles on the Xbox One. We're going to give away free Xbox 360 games on the Xbox One. You know, they could have done stuff like this. That's the problem. Now, admittedly, Steam, the problem with Steam, however, is that, as we all know, the PC retail space is basically dead. Yeah? If you go into, well, at least in the UK, if you go into a store and you find more than, like, 30 games on the shelves, unless it's, like, a big game specialist, you're doing really well. Why? Because it's just a point now where most people just buy the games online through Steam and stuff. It's become prevalent. At one point, it wasn't. At one point, it was like, eh, 50-50. Now, if you go to certain websites, Amazon, for example, sure, you could buy the disc-based version. Most of the time, it's not worth it. Now, however, you can go on Steam. Right now, as I record... I can load up Steam, and I can go to the store, and you've got stuff like Everland, 50% off. Sniper Elite, 75% off. 
which is absolutely insane. You've got the new Dead Island, Riptide, for only, well, 50% off. That's 17 great British pounds. You've got the first Dead Island, the Game of the Year edition, for five bucks. You've got City in Motion, 50% off. You've got a sale from all the Paradox um, titles. That, by the way, my good sirs, includes title, or and Adams, of course, that includes titles like Magicka, Massive reductions in them. So, this is what I think. This, assuming he is really an um, a disgruntled Microsoft employee. Regardless, if not, he makes some good points. Um, this is what they're saying. They, Microsoft just weren't aggressive. They kept on saying, "We're sorry, but you'll like it. I promise." It doesn't work in reality. So, okay, some of this stuff has gone over stuff we've already spoken about before. But I really just, I'm amazed really at just how all of this has gone. Obviously we've lost some of the really awesome abilities of the Xbox One. Um, but a lot of this is Microsoft's fault, honestly speaking. And I just, I don't really understand how they thought any of this was a good idea to begin with. They have gone back on something which kind of sets a dangerous precedent in some respects, they've managed to obviously throw away a lot of their research and development cash, which, you know, that's their problem, to be honest. But more to the point, they've managed to point out that they simply are unable to communicate with the gamers. I mean, I, I, I'm not a CEO of a big company, right? I'm not a PR manager, whatever. But come on. If you announce something like this, it doesn't take someone with more than two brain cells to say, well, you know what, they might react a little bit badly about this. Come on, have some freaking contingency plans. You don't know what Sony are planning. Sony didn't know what they were planning until basically E3 anyway. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks out from what rumours have been saying. So, just assume that your rivals are not going to do what you're doing. Just assume that they're going to try and make you look bad, because after all, it's possible you may be in competition with them, right? So, why wouldn't you have some level of contingency in there? Why wouldn't you try to create some kind of sale or something? You've You've basically got um, my, uh, EA as a partner so why can't you say to them look we want to reduce the price of the games and have sales okay the problem with that of course is the fact that they're basically still partners with retail shops and as I said earlier that's a major problem because you can't just undercut retail shops but surely after a little bit of time you could do that make it so that you're becoming less reliant on the retail shops if that's the route you want to go commit to something and this, this is kind of annoying me because I don't even say this as like a Microsoft hater or a Microsoft supporter. I'm just saying it as like a gamer, uh, primarily. Just focus on something and just get it right. Yeah, you're so you're telling us that this is the way forward and that we're going to appreciate it. The problem is, it's basically the equivalent of me telling you, well, when I, okay. Sir, you've got this appendicitis. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to rip open your, you know, body. I'm going to make various cuts in you, and you're going to feel extremely uncomfortable for the next several weeks. It's also possible that you'll most likely get an infection because my tools aren't that clean. And on top of that as well, I haven't really got that much training. You're not telling them the benefits. You'll keep telling them that once you've had this operation, you'll feel a lot better. Okay, well, tell them the benefits beforehand, right? Desensitize them a little bit to the negatives. Stop slapping them in the face previously. And this is the problem. They they kept telling us that you once you've coughed up the cash, you'll understand. The problem is you're getting battered in the media beforehand. Um, so, of course... We've been focused a lot on Microsoft on this video, but the reality of this, of course, is that it's not just Microsoft. AAA game development is becoming a hell of a lot more expensive. And it's getting to the point where development risk is becoming an issue. As said before, the development risk is becoming a huge issue, but 
you know, just look at the budgets of big games. You can just Google it yourselves. And it's becoming shocking, especially when you're talking about the PR, the marketing, that type of thing, when you're including that in the games. It becomes devastating for them not to do well. That's why studios close. Now, one can argue all day long about stuff like, well, piracy also affects it. True. But even if you discount piracy, used games are still a problem. Um, the problem is you've got to give consumers an option because used games are not going to go away while consumers believe that they're getting a, getting a good deal. And when you're punishing consumers by basically telling them, well, you've got to go online every 24 hours or, you know, you can't play this part of the game because you decided to buy it this way. Especially, for example, when it could have been a parent who grabbed it for their kid or whatever. It's just not good business sense. So you've got to reward them and some developers are doing that. Anyway, that's about it for this particular part of this video. I think it's already fairly uh, long and ranty enough. So I will see you soon. Take care and bye for now.